Hello, welcome to one of my videos on the subject of Brexit. I thought that this is an opportune time uh, to consider the answer to the question about whether or not Brexit um, was a good or bad idea. And in doing so, I think it's important to just articulate the two strands of the argument about you know, going back to 2016. For the people who said remain uh, was the best option, the idea was about you're in alliance with uh, other European countries in a free trade area. That is the best area to remain. There's no need to rock the boat and make any brave or seemingly stupid decision. It's better to just stay in, in that family and in the spirit of economic and brotherhood and that would be the best thing to do. And that anything else would be risky without knowing what the future uh, would offer. Now, on the other hand, you had the um, leave argument, which was about Britain going alone and getting a bad deal with the EU. And that in a sense, going out on its own, Britain would be able to, the United Kingdom would be able to um, gain more in terms of um, you know, its future uh, economic prospects. Now, if we look at um, that argument in relation to Remain, it's really very similar to the argument when Britain um, had a referendum, having joined the EU, and then the debate was about whether to stay in or the EU economic community, European community, was about whether or not it was better than the argument was for those who wanted to stay outside of the EU. The argument was that already have established links with a whole host of different countries, um, there would be a hit from um, going down the European route, better to stay with what you know, and that's, you know, and, and that was the argument. And Edward Heath at the time, um, argument, and he was the one who took Britain into the EU, his argument um, in not doing the referendum, but prior to doing so, was an acknowledgement in the Conservative uh, manifesto for, I think, the 74 election, or maybe it might have been the 70, essentially saying that, yes, there would be a hit from um, joining the, the EU, but that it was in the long-term prospects of uh, the United Kingdom. So now that we put the arguments behind us, you now look at now as to what the situation is and, and what... Um, what people would say is that there's an element of uh, Brexit regret from the population in general. And that um, that's because the upheaval that um, took place as a result of leaving the EU has not been worth it. Now, I'll break that down into two strands. There's the argument about whether or not leaving was a good idea in terms of what do you do with the um, regulatory freedom that you have. Okay, And then there's the argument about the hit that you are likely to take. If we follow the Edward Heath argument for joining the European Union, then therefore a hit is not, you know, it's not surprising at all because you are changing. The question is that what do you do with the regulatory freedom that you have? And what the UK has done, I would say um, significantly was done to join the comprehensive, the CPTPP, um, Trans-Pacific Partnership. And that I think has been the most significant in terms of change in, in, in economic relations. And that is something that, whilst there have been estimates about what that will bring in the long term, I think it's, it's very difficult to know. And it's also about whether or not one thinks that you should take the safe course or whether or not you should be brave. Now, showing my age again, I go back to when Mrs. Thatcher was advocating the idea about Britain moving from um, manufacturing to financial services. And I should say that this financial services ethos has certainly guided the, the, the policy of the government in terms of post-Brexit, in terms of where it's looking to get advantages, not so much in goods. And, and the sort of argument that she made at the time was that there was a need for change. Finance was the way to go. And, um, and I remember the time talking about, uh, you know, Canary Wharf and, and so on. And there were a lot of people who poo-pooed the idea that she came up with and sort of saying it was a fantasy. And all of that uh, ultimately led to Big Bang and so on. So you look back at the time and you think, OK, so many people thought it was negative. It wouldn't work and, and everything of the sort. And there might be people who might argue that because of the financial crisis, it didn't work. But at the end of the day, Britain has modified whereby its main 
business that he does is financial services. Not the only one, but certainly the number one. So the thing about when you're making a change is that you can make a change that is foolish and you can make a change that people may resist and you may turn out to be inspiring. And one of the things that I think feeds into that is really as to where we are in relation to any big thing that, um, and not just about Brexit, but other things that governments try to do. And a lot of times the argument, even this argument about HS2 is all about, oh, it's too expensive and so on. And you look at some of the projects by, um, you know, for, uh, forefathers, if I can put it that way, uh, in terms of different things or buildings that were built, bridges that were built, or even parliament, you ask yourself, if these things, if there was an attempt to do these things now, would that really uh, work? Because there would be a process about whether or not it costs too much money. Uh, there was somebody I met a long time ago who um, said this, which is not an original saying, is that, that you have to spend money to make money. And we look at that within the context of, say, example, Amazon. I remember at the beginning, it was just losing money. It was just people had to keep investing, investing, investing. Uh, and, there, the, the, and there was patience. And now Amazon is an extremely valuable company. And so the point is that, there, and I'm not saying that's what's going to happen in relation to Brexit, but the point to make is that if you do something dramatic, you have to use your best efforts to make it work and you can you judge the results, uh, um, you know, much later on. And that I think, and so when um, Kiestama um, said the other day about, uh, not, about not wanting to diverge from the EU, you then ask the question, well, what's the whole point of Brexit if you're not going to diverge? The idea is that you must be able to do, not diverge for diverse sake, let's be clear, not divergence for divergence sake, but in terms of the things that you think that you can do, because you make a decision on your own, rather than one where you have to um, have a decision and compromises among 27 member states, and that might, um, you know, the number is likely to increase in the EU in terms of the years to come. So I, I think that's the point I'm making, that there seems to be an a lack of an appetite to do anything brave. Anything brave is seen as risky. And I think that's the mentality you have when you perceive yourself at the top of the tree rather than at the bottom of the tree. If you are at the top, you want to safeguard what you have. If you are at the bottom, you can afford to be brave and innovative. And that's what you have in relation to, um, um, you know, China, for example, where he has come on in the last 20, 30 years. But if we look at the United States, for example, if you compare, say, for example, in 2008, what you had was that the size of the EU economy, including Britain and the United States before the financial crisis was about the same. And now since 2008, we are, you know, 15 years on and you see the United States economy, the, the um, nominal GDP has significantly surpassed what the EU um, has, even if you include Britain in that calculation. And you ask yourself, why is that? It's because of the climate in terms of how you make decisions. And, you know, you, you, I mean, some of us, I'm sure many of us have worked for organization where you find that the more people you have in the decision making, the more you're likely to end up with bad decisions. If you had the right person at the head of the organization, the right decisions would be taken, would be taken. But if you have the wrong person, <laughs> and that's the risk, then you end up with terrible decisions. But also, if you have a group decision, what happens is that you're trying to accommodate for everything. And, and, I, and I love this word, unity. You know, you must be united um, in terms of the EU. You can't be united just for united, just to be united. It, it doesn't make any sense. So the point is that why has the United States power ahead? It's able to make its own decision and it's able to be innovative and brave. And it does what it perceives to be in its best interest. So, for example, the United States with the Inflation Reduction Act, no matter how much, you know, the Europeans have complained about it, the United States has not really changed the legislation. There, there have been some tweaks, but it's all about doing what they perceive to be best for them. And that is the reality of, of, of what it is. And the, the point is that the idea about oh, if Britain is going to go back to join the EU the point of fact is that you have to ask yourself, why is it that the, the United States economy has powered ahead of the European Union economy 
in the last 15 years. And you have to say that it's about innovation. And if you look at the, you know, at the companies that have been innovative over a, a longer period of time, you find that they come from the United States or, or, or in modern days, um, China, for example, you've got South Korea, you've got Japan. What Europe has is legacy industries, old industries. And if we're talking about, I mean, we talk, for example, cars, we say, okay, battery technology is China because they started investing in that years ago. And the point is that if you want to create something that you go, it's just like an investment that you hope to reap in many years to come and you will make mistakes because it seems like governments are hesitant about making mistakes when inevitably there's some investments that are going to pay off. There's some investments that are not going to pay off. It's, it's really reality and it's business. And the point that I think you have to consider within the context of Brexit is not the act of Brexit itself. It's about what you choose to do with the freedoms that, you know, that have come as a result and uh, whether or not governments can be imaginative enough, capable as well. And, you know, I can understand arguments about that and so say the government is not capable, it doesn't have an idea and all that kind of thing. I can hear those particular arguments. But we know that the evidence shows, and that has been evident over the last, you know, so many years, that future growth lies in Asia. The share of European Union, uh, uh, share of the world economy has been shrinking over the last 20 years, and it keeps shrinking further. The other areas are challenging it, and in terms of, you know, even you had, um, you know, Mohammed bin Salman, the Saudi um, crown prince, talking about wanting... Um, the Gulf states to be the new um, the new Europe and the fact is that what I hear a lot of European Union politicians talk about is about solidarity it's about regulation the fact is that if you want to spend money on services you've got to make money and I look at jobs within the context have you created a job that is not all jobs can be like that but are you creating jobs that will make money and too many um, um, European countries, including Britain, have a significant budget deficit. And, um, and I think that there are bigger questions than really the mere um, discussion about Brexit. It's really about the approach that Europe takes at the moment in relation to you know, advancement. And it's really funny to hear, um, you know, funny in an ironic sense, to hear the other day the European Union talking about to do with AI about leading in terms of how to regulate AI. Not about how to create it, how to enhance it, how to take advantage of it, why it's at the same time safeguarding it. It's all about how to regulate it, how to control it. I mean, that sounds very uh, communist, <laughs> if I may be so brave um, to say so. Anyway, those are my thoughts. I still think it's much too early to know about the long-term effects of Brexit, I think you need 10, 20 years, but it's also about the policies that um, governments of uh, whatever color choose to take. Thank you very much for watching and see you next time. Goodbye.